safety, 24 hours, you can be released, access to a lawyer. Section 29, no rights. In fact, no one knows. Hey, mom, I'm at Weinberg Police Station. Indy. I don't know where I am. I don't know how long I'm going to be, but I can't keep me for six months. I have access to no one. No lawyer, no doctor, and no one knows where I am being held. The only problem with Section 29 is that they can renew Section 29 if you don't cooperate. So I've got to sort that one out. Uh, and um, and then also people disappear during section 29, I think. Many of us know people disappear. I mean, the police claim, they claim they released them. And then later on we hear about, no, 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 they actually slipped on the box. So, so yes, when we did our workshop, I mean, uh, we went to Silver Mines because, you know, we weren't allowed to move, meet anyone the UDF couldn't meet, UWO couldn't meet, I mean, UCO couldn't meet. So we went to Silver Mines, they made no right to workshop. So Raya was so nervous. <laughs> she didn't bother to be part of the workshop. And three days later, she and Colin were arrested at the border with Yasmina Pandy and I think... Um, Claude Pedro, no? Shit. Anyway, so obviously, here I am. Gray cement floors. Oh, bits of black and grime. I should get some room to sweep and clean up here. Gray sheets. I've never ever seen gray sheets before. Gray sheet and gray, and gray mattress. And then this sort of light beige wall. You know, sort of little gosh, but they've scrubbed things off. So I'm just thinking if those were the most phallocentric things and these other things that are on here bombard me. Then I have a row of bars right on top there. So I can't really see out. Just my luck to be detained in winter and I'm such a cold, cold person. But the point is bars and then on either side you have mesh. And the mesh is so full of dust that even the pale winter sun can't penetrate. Yeah, so maybe, maybe, maybe three by two. And then I also have a private exercise yard. Not everyone can boast a private exercise yard, just outside. Except my little private exercise yard is like a cage because it's got bars and mesh on top. Anyway can't complain, but the worst, now you see with the prison, you first have bars, right? There's a steel door with bars. And then you have a thick steel door, which is also closed. But in my case, Article 20, Section 29, that door, steel door is left open. Then you have my exercise yard, and then you have another set of bars and another steel door, which is also left open. Now, all the other steel doors are closed. So, of course, when anyone walks past, they peep in to see what's going on there. So, you have your guard sitting there. But the decor of the cell is a little bit problematic because. You have the cell door here, and you have the cell door there, and you have the bed here, and you have the toilet there. As if you're not dehumanized enough. So your toilet is there, and everyone can see you if they walk past. So the other day, I took my red towel, and I made a little, little curtain here. And do you know that this, I'll just, I'll call it a colored bitch. Very insensitive, very unfeminist, but she's a colored bitch. All the other white women, they sit there with their royal ruasa and they one plain, one pearl, and when the police come, they hide it away. But no, um, I think she's only, uh, I don't know what the rank is, but I think she's very low. But May, 
sits there. And she expects me to sit on the bed all the time so she can see me in some perverse way. Here's a nice cement, cement uh, um, bench where I can sit on, you know, but she wants me there. But I just showed up, sat there. But anyway, so I'm going to clean the cell. And what am I going to do? I'm not sure how long I'm going to be here. But maybe, maybe I can do a little play. I can look at the play. And I'm going to make a little poem for whatever happens. Eh? Okay, so I think, I think I'll use their own words, endorsed out. Group areas act, homelands. This is my reality. I have been endorsed out of my community and do a group areas act reserved for terrorists. I've been endorsed and here I am where I am perused, searched, looked at every minute of the day. And this is written down whether I sit, stand, sit or sleep. And then it's communicated to someone who knows where. When I think of this country, so-called Africans, they have this every single day of their lives, being watched. Have you ever gone to a supermarket or a mall when African people come? Oh, the floor walkers on guard. You know, these are the people who steal. So now I'm in this situation. And yes, millions of people have to irk out this Reality, Rajini, but not for long. Okay, so I'm looking for this. Let's get water. Varan Vata as the belief, hot water, I want to clean this floor. One thing about prison that I have learned. Is it staff or deaf? And they taunt you. Baron Barter, I said, please. Hot water, please, in case you are gonna understand. Thank you. <laughs> Never mind the floor, so bloody cold. Gee, man, life is great. Warm water. Oh. <laughs> that was now a real treat for me. Eh? Imagine hot water. Yeah. I don't know with the shower. You see, I didn't know. It's maybe their way of economizing. There I was. Now, in the courtyard, in your private exercise yard, sorry, there's a little button and you're going to push this button. But the point is, when you push the button, the water comes down. I don't know if some of you know about that. But because it's raining, you're not sure whether the shower walked or was the rain. And the point is, you, your finger gets sore. So I couldn't shower, you know, long enough. And then, of course, Security police brought my lunch in and he waited until I was naked. Now, I mean, can you believe that? Can you believe that? But I told him, I told him. Because it was my big cup, Ali. Yep. <laughs> you know, the light is on for 24 hours. And my neighbor next door, like I was doing my inventory, you know, every describing me. He said, oh, the fucking monkeys looked the because the light has got like a basket around it. I think they don't must have access to any glass in case of something. Day four. Such a little noise. I wonder what it can be. Maynard Bull! Midnight! No, no, no! Friday night, late night shopping, that's it. 
actually. You see, they took, they take your watch away. And of course, then it's winter and there's no light coming in. Everything looks so the important thing is you've got to listen to sounds. You listen to sounds and you work out a program. So anyway, so it's Friday late night shopping. And every day, I must say, first of all, which day? So it's the 20th today. And day four. And then I must keep my wits about and work out the time. Day five, 21st of May, 1988. There's music, there's music. Music. It's Maynard Bull. And it's the, the community carnival. Oh! Okay. I'm going to listen. Hooray! It's carnival time! It's carnival time! The music from across the, the road blares into my soul. At first, harsh and strident, supposed to attract the passers by. But then, faint and scratchy, I think it's where the wind is blowing. There's a shriek! Oh! Maybe some excitement on the swings. Or maybe some child is lost, shame, or frightened. I can see lovers <laughs> walking hand in hand, eating ice creams. <laughs> or even minis, you know, they always buy minis. <laughs> and then, some discerning person in some dark corner <laughs> eating an enormous hamburger. <laughs> Onion leaves <laughs> and down the side of his mouth. <laughs> and the music stopped. Oh, uh, okay. Here's an important announcement. Either someone's child has been lost, shame. Oh, there was a wonderful prize to be won. I hear the sounds. Each store with its own sound to attract passers by. And the bang, bang, shoot yourself a prize store. And I sit and I listen to the music. Starts again. And I... I try not to cry. Day 10. Okay, I'm here. I haven't said a word. Remember, you're not supposed to say anything for the first 48 hours. Although I don't think it was in our case. Huh? But anyway, leave it aside. So look, I'm here, and how am I going to deal with this? Now, the night before I was detained, Indy said to me, I must come to her house. I went to Cook's, and Indy, just like the, we have in Pimpies in our areas and in our organizations, Bongani, who was detained about um, a year ago, smuggled out a message. Now, my story, and, oh, oh, what Bungani said, and maybe a little bit nervous, um, that all the security police know about me, all the trees and trials in the country have been interrogated about me, and they're not detaining me. So Bungani just felt that I should be very careful and not drive around maybe late at night on my own, because he thinks maybe they just, you know, they'll just eliminate me, they'll just assassinate me. Anyway, so Indy said to me, look, Bungani says this is a story. That when I'm, if I am detained, I must stick to the story that I met Bongani at Indy's house. Bongani, and of course, Indy and I are from Uwawe and Uka. And Bongani and Indy are having an illicit relationship. And that is why I met him, and that's why he always comes at night. Because the neighbors of Indy are related to his wife. And that's my story, okay? So, I haven't said anything yet. You know, I didn't realize that actually, yes, 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 of course, I am a prisoner. 
you don't know what power you have. You know, I just sit there. And I realized that my silence is my power. So that's my story. So, okay, so now I've got to sort myself out. Now, the point is, if things get too bad, you might at least see little things that, you know, put you up here. When things get too bad, you have to listen to the questions. You work out what they really know, what they pretend to know, and also if they said person A said A, B, C, then you know, no, but that person couldn't have said that. So that's what you've got to do. So when it gets too bad, I actually have to just admit to the things they know. Of course, they got my passport, they got the bank accounts. So if things get too bad at the moment, it's just Silence is golden, golden. Silence is golden, golden. Such. Day 20. I've just been interrogated. But the point about being interrogated is that you never, at least it's a lovely drive, right? This lovely drive from Weinberg, go up the Deval Drive, we saw all the different green trees, you know, and you can see people, and you know. But of course, I just had my silence is golden. And um, they first showed the videos. And I just said, no, I don't know those people. And then they showed other videos where I was actually speaking to the people. And you know, it's actually made me now. When the hell was that video taken in my room? In our meetings, comrade, in our meetings. I just said, Yeah, yeah, no, I'm sticking to that person. But you know, these is these is because the names are so difficult. I just say comrade, comrade. I just say comrade. I don't know the person's name. They just gave me a dirty look. Then they gave me an album. No, a few albums. Page through the albums, identify the people and say who they were and what I know about them. Imagine paging through an album and there you see people that were at Chrissy with you, people that, <laughs> that you knew that down the road. Now, Anyone? So angry. So, now, the point is, we're never alone. I have Lena. Uh, not only do I have a private uh, exercise yard, I also have a private chaperone, you know, and I don't know what the guy's name is. So, it doesn't matter where you go, if you go to your toilet while you've been interrogated, Lena goes along. So now I come back into the cell and I can see that the toilet is cut for this woman who's not saying anything. And we have two women inside the cell. And then he shouts at them. His booming voice bellows out instructions, pulling you into instant servitude. The correct buttons have been pushed. You pawns. Or two pawns in his game of power, male arrogance, and, and, and authority. To search myself. His voice booms again. Stripper! <coughs> I don't wait for you to once again dehumanize me. I start stripping and I throw my clothes to the farthest ends of the cell. And I stand there. Der Sukha Bedekut. Search her bed. I watch you how you, woman with power, carefully touch every 
see every fold of my clothes. He languidly to take off the sheets. His voice booms again. How after kitten through? Look at me. I'm not quite sure if it's conspiratorial or contentious. He just say, "Dar is geen kitten slup nie. There is no pillowcase." I look at you, and you look at me. Knowing that there is a pillowcase, day I dream some sort of sisterhood. Day hundred. Okay. Ah. Uh. Is that Dunson name? Okay, is that Dunson name coming into the cell? Is that a dagger I see before me? My father. I think I see my father. I can't be my father. I can't be my father. I can't. I can't. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. <laughs> Benzenina, 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 Amandla, away to. Amanda, away to Amanda, away to Amanda, away to Amanda. By the bomb, where? I, I, I asked her what the time was, but it, you didn't work out. <laughs> Allow me to introduce you to, to, to Dr. Gertrude Fester, um, professor in the Sun and Koi Center at the University of Cape Town. She um, was performing on the panel Unsilenced Bodies. And I was supposed to explain what this panel is about, but I think Osi Gertrude did, did that for me. Um, they couldn't silence her in 1988, and believe me, many, many patriarchs have tried to silence her ever since, and they still continue to fail. <laughs> um, I'm going to read her biography quickly. So, so in order to remain sane and focused during the solitary confinement of four and a half months, Gertrude created this play in her head about her experiences, as there were no writing materials. She says, once I was awaiting trial, I also embarked on extensive drawings, making cards and writing letters. During our long, nearly three-year trial, the 14 of us became known as the Rainbow Trial because of the representative nature of the 14 trialists in terms of race, class, and creed. We communicated extensively. The long hours of court were taxing and sometimes uninspiring. So we all wrote several notes to one another and made drawings. I have kept copies of all the aforesaid prison rules, letters to the major pro protesting about the prison conditions and that we were not allowed to have newspapers, etc. Reading through these remnants of a very challenging time for me will be very therapeutic. 
I hence see the action process of the creation of this project as healing. With all these resources, I would like to create a multimedia installation. And you'll see the beginnings of that outside as, as you walk past. Um, as much as going through these documents bring up neg negative memories, I'm also enthralled by my inner resilience and how I survived a very difficult period. Um, so shall we do one more for Gertrude? And, and thank you. Um, thank you for doing that so we could be here today. Because without you and people like you, we would never be sitting um, at the UCT Graduate School of Business Conferencing. So, <laughs> um, amongst many things that she doesn't say, Gertrude was also my mentor. At the, she was the first ever Khoisan Commission on Gender Equality and the first lesbian um, to be appointed. And I was the second. And so, so when I began my term, I immediately called her going, oh, see, <laughs> this bureaucratic guerrilla struggle. How do you wage state feminism? And she held my hand through the next five years. Very sweet. So it's one of these things people don't actually know about, Gertrude, but I wanted to, to acknowledge that. Um, so now moving from the past to the future and that very future that you thought, fought for. I'll oh, see. Um, here it is in Living Color. We've introduced Mlamli Tiulu, who is going to present the reimagination of love, healing, and memory. This paper examines post democratic South Africa by looking at the rights and freedoms enjoyed in the new dispensation, as well as various threats like patriarchy that limit such given rights. The focus will be on how patriarchy manifests itself through violence and how this violence mutates itself into various forms. Furthermore, this paper will examine how this violence polices human desire under the scope of what is acceptable within a belief system, culture, or tradition. Because such desire is policed and in a way subdued, Sexuality is therefore seen as obscene when it falls outside of the mentioned boundaries and in such an, as such a new element is introduced, guilt, that makes entertaining desire or expressing sexuality a traumatic ordeal. To counter this then, love has to be a deliberate act of protestation to go against the machinery of such guilt. It asserts itself in language and action, two elements that give love its political character. This paper focuses on and answers the question of whether patriarchy limits sexuality and desire or not, and whether such limitation therefore makes it a necessity for love to be political in nature. Mlami, very welcome and happy to hear you. Righty. Um, can I actually stand? Or should I sit? Okay. Thank you. I just feel like I'm going to die if I sit. I'm so nervous. Um, first of all, should I stand over here? All right, let me just stand over there. Excuse me. Just stand over here. Thank you. All right, so first and foremost, let me just say good morning to everybody. And I think the nerves just like started checking in as soon as I stepped into the door and I was just like, oh, Professor Barbara Boswell was just like, oh my word. <laughs> um, then, but um, anyway, I'm very happy being here and thank you for the invitation. So first and foremost, I'm a storyteller. I use the lexicon of language to observe, interpret and understand the world. In simple terms, this is akin to saying that I'm in constant state of restlessness that is brought about by the never-ending journey of trying to rid society of all untruth. Because truth, I believe, is what is necessary to make sense of the essence of our existence and the various complexities, nuances, and ambiguities encompassed by this. So the Nigerian writer Ken Saro Wiwa sums this aptly when he says, quote, unquote, the writer cannot be a mere storyteller. He cannot be a mere teacher. He cannot be 
he cannot merely x-ray society's weaknesses, its ills, its perils. He or she, insert they, must be actively involved in shaping the present and the future. This paper thus settles on the reimagination of love, healing, and memory, and relies on the critical writings of writers, activists, and scholars. So let's start with love, the whole concept of love. I think the, 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 the novelist Panashi Chigumadzi states that the creation and maintenance of the idea of the other racist and colonial ideas of difference have always required a sense of fixedness of identities. Making sense of this brings about a closer confrontation with binaries. Of binaries, as Chuck Palahniuk noted, it drives us crazy if there's something that cannot be this or that. So I, as soon as I stepped in, I think as soon as I sat down, I was having a conversation with the delegate sitting right over there. And the first thing that I actually said to him was that it makes society very uncomfortable when one cannot fit into a certain box that they're supposed to fit into. And so that is when I think binaries become extremely problematic because as soon as we cannot understand something, we try to label it, all right? And as soon as something falls outside of the labels that we think should be used, um, we, 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 we sort of exert a certain form of violence that we, we, we actually do. I think it's sort of a subconscious process whereby we are exerting violence without even know, knowing that we are exerting that violence. And so um, this, this, this was a thought that started a few years ago while I was attending a gender conference at UWC. And I spoke to an academic during tea time and remarked that I was made uncomfortable by the idea that we needed to constantly probe things that we cannot name. So, because unless things, people, and relationships fit into binaries, it has become common practice to unleash violence guised as an attempt of understanding those things that do not fit into our expectations or set standards of what we call acceptable and rational. And so, the towering writer Toni Morrison would say about racism that it is a distraction. I find that the same logic finds application in different shortcomings of society. Fixed ideas about identities allow little to no room for the complexities of sexuality. How one thing can mean so many other things and how our existence and bodies and skins should be allowed to find meaning and validity and be allowed autonomy independent of the gaze of heteronormative and patriarchal ideas and opinions. So having noted the violence that is perpetuated under the guise of trying to understand, I think there's a failure to identify the greatest tragedy that, is, that emerges but is hardly ever mentioned, and that is guilt. So guilt is the feeling of shame that attaches itself to those who deviate from norms that are set by societal constructs. Because any form of rebellion against the status quo is frowned upon, which explains why the politics of interruption are often silenced. So silencing is the first threat of the politics of interruption. This explains the deliberate attempt to brutally attack in both physically and verbally abusive ways anyone who is considered a misfit to accepted ways and expected ways of being. I speak especially to the silencing of black lesbian activists by murderers who in violence speak silence this one and the other in order to curb this thing. Because in a society where patriarchal and heteronormative ideas persist, any misfit can be silenced and the perpetrators still roam the streets because silencing is a tool that is meant to control and subdue all misunderstood forms and manifestations of love. It is a means of denigrating bodies and most of all, instilling fear. So I think that the price that is often paid by those who deviate from such societal norms and standards, those whose sexualities fall outside of enforced boundaries, is that they have to endure societal trauma, which is a phenomenon that is prevalent in, 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 in society, especially in black societies. Um, this is the trauma brought about by the inflicted guilt that makes entertaining desire or expressing sexuality a traumatic ordeal. 
This societal trauma is no new phenomenon. It has been in existence since time immemorial and doesn't always find expression in the most overt ways, but rather under what falls within the scope of that which is considered both acceptable and palatable. So this is primarily kept in place by religious institutions, cultures, and traditions. Therefore, any attempt at dismantling this means that love in all its forms and manifestations should be and is a deliberate act of protestation. It goes against the very machinery of the mentioned guilt and asserts itself in two ways, through language and behavior. The language that we use to attempt explaining and asserting ourselves is important when it comes to our activism. As Ngugi Wathiongo, the East African writer notes, quote unquote, language, any language has a dual character. It is both a means of communication and a carrier of culture. This means that if we are to dream of a world where love can just be love without it having to be a revolutionary in its construct, the language that we use in our discourse becomes pivotal in the dismantling of violent structures. Secondly, as Professor Nomboni Sukasa would warn us at the 12th Nelson Mandela Lecture Dialogue Series, our approach to situations should always be from a place of curiosity. It becomes both dangerous and problematic when we use the word always as our approach to things, because that means that things are understood, accepted and practiced without curiosity. And as she would remark that that is not helping us today, always does not suit the radical intervention needed by the people as we experience various societal ills and oppression. I therefore argue that language and the attitude we use to approach situations are two elements which give love its political character. This therefore means that love should not be understood as a passive abstract quality, but as an active revolutionary act. This understanding, of course, has its own shortcomings because we should always remember that the ideal world is one in which love does not need to be a revolutionary. It is where people can fall in love without there being a need for their love to be seen as revolutionary or political. It is where love is enough. As Professor Nomboniso remarked, we are facing a crisis of imagination. To combat this, means that concepts like love, healing, and memory need constant revisiting and refurbishing. Reimagination should thus be a constantly evolving process. I'll move on to my second point, which will be on memory. Ocean Vong, the author of the stellar novel On Earth, We're Briefly Gorgeous, stated that memory can be a second chance. He further stated that memory is a choice, but if you were God, you'd know it's a flood, he says. Memory should thus be understood as the deliberate process of remembering. But as the novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie once stated, we remember differently. And that is something that is pivotal in the process of remembering. That what may be your version of events might not be the version of events of another. And that is something that we as a society, I feel, have not explored enough. This means that the way in which we look at the past with all its details, both gruesome and jovial, provides an opportunity um, to view memory as less passive and more active. This means that memory gives us greater control of situations that we find ourselves in. Memory should thus constantly be revisited. And while there are vital lessons to be learned from the past, the past should be allowed, should not be allowed to determine our direction. Therefore, reimagination means taking charge of the various legacies that remain with us from the past. While we cannot change how the past has affected us, but reimagining it gives us a second chance and provides an opportunity for us to be less receptive of the past and more in control of it and the overall impact that it has over our lives and future. It is stated in the final TRC report, and I think I found this particularly interesting, um, that Mrs. Ngeo, whose son had been killed during apartheid, said, we want, and I quote, we want to demonstrate a humaneness, Ubuntu, towards them, the perpetrators, so that it may restore their own sense of humanity, unquote. In response to this, 
The poet Anki, Professor Anki Kro, in her book, Begging to be Black, says, analyzing the sentences in the TRC sentences about forgiveness, one picks up how both literate and illiterate Black people formulated forgiveness in terms of this interconnected humaneness. And I think I found this particularly interesting because the argument that Professor Anki Kroch makes is that we are all interconnected as a people. And therefore, in order to understand your own shortcomings, it is very important that you don't do so um, in isolation, that you should understand that whatever shortcomings you have, chances are someone else has the same shortcomings. So in order to understand your own humanity, it's important for you to understand humanity as a collective. And so I think this argument goes further because I argue further that there are many ways of remembering and thus memory should be viewed as a process that should constantly be revisited as I've already stated, but it should also be understood as complex, which means that there is more than one way of looking at it. Sometimes it is a second chance and sometimes we may choose to erase memory and whichever option you choose, it is okay. And I think that's the message that hasn't been preached enough. Validating ourselves and how we feel is a vital part of the process of memory and how memory is interpreted and understood and accepted or not accepted within society on healing. So I think when I was really, um, excuse me, when I was looking at the idea of, of, of healing, I think I found that I had to draw on my own experiences because I think I've been grappling with the idea of healing for many years. So the loss of my father in 2015, excuse me, awakened me to the pain and reality of loss, of grief. I learned what it meant, what it took for a boy to mourn, to grieve, to cry in a society that views this as a taboo. Navigating the dynamics surrounding this was a Herculean task that made me aware of the extent of the damage that society instills. How we as boys, and I'll speak especially for black boys, are taught from a young age to suppress our feelings. Um, how our feelings are not acknowledged because we are taught to be men when we are only boys. So I think it takes away from the humanity that should be taught within society. That if we are going to continue with a culture of telling our boys that they have to suppress their feelings. It takes away from the fact that they're human. We're denying them their humanity. And so I think having experienced that myself, I think when I lost my father in 2015 and I had to grapple with the idea of loss, of grief, of healing, I think it was very, very confusing for me. I found that, that process very confusing. Um, so I understand now that trauma cannot be undone but there's an urgent need to understand that this should, we should not be in a, in a hurry to run away from it, all right? So we should always be sensitive to the various stages of learning and healing we need to undergo, to be patient with our bodies and to grasp the reality that sometimes we will get it wrong, sometimes we will fall, sometimes we will, we will, we will feel like we are failing at healing. It is not an easy process. Like truth, healing is a journey and not a destination. Trauma, grief, loss can damage people and things. One's need for healing means that one is ready to look into the intricacies of one's own life, not to rush oneself and to strive to be the, version, the best version of oneself. So policing the way in which boys grieve and express their pain is akin to denying them the healing that they desire and a means of encouraging the prevalence of trauma and perpetual pain. Being human thus means that our bodies will not always be protestation. Sometimes we will cry and yearn for healing and strength. The reimagination of healing thus means that we are constantly evolving in the journey of life. And that is okay. We must refuse and rebel against a society that denies us the possibilities that come with reimagination. As Ocean Vong would say in his beautiful novel, 
um, titled On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. And this is a conversation that takes place between Little Dog and his partner. And he says, Little Dog, what were you before you met me? He says, I think I was drowning. What are you now? He says, water. Thank you. Okay, so um, we have about 15 minutes or so for questions, comments, contributions. You, you, yeah, you can sit here because you will <laughs> be sure to get some. Um, you, can, you can stay here because oh. we're going to still do question time. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not at all. So, um, so, so while you think, oh, there, there we have right at the back. <laughs> Paula has a question. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? I can't hear myself. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to thank both Mlamli and um, Gertrude, because I think when we were um, putting together Athens this year, one of the things we really wanted was an intergenerational conversation. Mm. And I think you've just shown us that so beautifully, an intergenerational conversation um, about silencing, about memory, uh, about love and revolution. Um, and I just, I suppose I've got, I've got two questions. I've got one for, for Gertrude, um, which is something to do with um, perhaps linked to what Mlamli has, was saying about memory right, um, about perhaps how we approach memory um, and how you then relate that to, to your performance and to your writing. Um, what does it do for you now to relive those moments through performance? Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that so that I can, I can give other people um, an opportunity. Thank you. Um, sorry, and just a reminder that our online um, moderator as well is Namusa Mukuba, and she's all, Mukubu, and she's also fielding questions on the Zoom platform. So if there's any questions coming in via the Zoom platform, Namusa will raise a hand and send the questions through as well to our panelists. Thank you very much for that question. And thank you. Yes, I, I was quite uh, struck by the intergenerational. I was really happy about it. I always try to um, have intergenerational um, panels and yep, because there's so much that we can learn and share. Um, I, I'm, I'm just always quite taken aback how little people know about um, South Africa before 1994, that's one. I mean, I, I get, I'm, I'm quite taken aback by that. I mean, I was teaching a, a class of masters and nobody could, could ask, could answer where does 16th of June come from? So I'm quite taken aback at the... And also, at one, just one point. Do you know that we have had interviews as, and I want to use the plural because I come part of a movement and women's movement and, and feminist movement. We've been interviewed by so many people from all over the world. And somehow very few South African young people. And I, I, I think that's quite interesting. Does it mean, in fact, at one stage when Vivian Taylor had a, a um, sorry, I'm taking a bit long. Let me just get to my question quickly. When Vivian Taylor had a Robin, ex Robin Island uh, prisoner in her sociology class at, at UCT, um, she said to the class afterwards, You people were very silent, you know, you were really quite vociferous and, you know, talking a lot and asking. So he, they said, Oh, but that was your struggle, it's not our struggle. So I, so I, I almost find myself on that wave and, and I think it's also important to to engage with younger women and younger people because I think that many of the rights that are taken for granted they do not always realize how how difficult it was to achieve those rights 
but also the point is that these rights are not written in stone and we just look at our society how you know there's still a lot of struggle to come so yes i, I think it's important to share and, and yes i do find it cathartic and um uh, I also found that when I was writing a paper for, for memory and healing in 2001, I remembered something that I, could, I completely forgot about, being forgotten about. I was in the Blanco Hospital in, in, in Paulsmoor, and they forgot about me. And when, I, when they eventually came, I said, well, how long was it for? And they wouldn't say. So I still don't know, you know how long it's been away. So yes, there are some questions that I have. And um, I've, I find, and I also, you know, before I was, marking i was spending a lot of time and now bob i have more time to do these things and to write these things because i actually did drama for my first degree and um i love theater and i've been used theater in teaching etc cetera, etc cetera. but all my students go graham study etc cetera, et cetera. and then but we were the degree people not the performers people and then at one stage uh, peter crummick said oh can you be in my play and i thought but i wasn't uh, i wasn't auditioned and i was a little upset that i wasn't auditioned I mean, I got the script, it was for Colored Maid. And I decided, Barnsley, I'm not going to be part of this, right? So, yes, I'm now also using this, uh, what I love to maybe act, to do theatre groups with other people. So, yeah, that's it. And to start with my own experiences, I hope I've answered your question. I've sort of went around. <laughs> oh, my word. <laughs> I think I lost the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yes, please. I'm sorry. I think I was I was pushing the two of you to think about the work of memory. Mm -hmm. um, and now that, um, in a way, Gertrude has almost I'd say it's a provocation mm -hmm. around the future, mm -hmm. the youth, and and forgetting maybe mm -hmm. um, the idea that a struggle is over. Mm -hmm. It might be interesting to for you to sort of respond or mm -hmm. you know from your position mm -hmm. um, to this intergenerational element. Mm -hmm. So one thing I, I I think I really really find interesting is 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 the question. Are struggles ever really over? Mm, exactly. And so very so good. I, I, I think I think I think I think that interests me. And I think with 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 this, okay, I know it's gonna sound weird when I say with this new generation of thinkers. And then um um, but I think we are constantly grappling with that question because I think growing up, um, there was this, I don't know, there was this sense of the struggle is over, we've got to learn to move on. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not only referring to one struggle, I'm referring to the various struggles. There's, there's always a sense that when, 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 when we reach democracy, when we reach that, the struggle is over. But we are hardly ever conscious of the various struggles that, that, that come after the main struggle. And I think we're constantly grappling with that and, and, and relating that to the idea of forgetfulness. I feel like it is important for young people to tell their stories in the most authentic ways, because then we are able to articulate our various struggles. And that is very important in ensuring that things are never forgotten, that we archive the memory of the struggle and that we pave the way for those who are coming after us so that they can understand that these struggles have been dealt with and that they should just continue with, with being revolutionary and radical in how they deal with their own struggles. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we um, have five more minutes. So I see Barbara. Barbara's Oh, hello. Thank you. Thank you so much for this panel. It's been quite um, just evocative, and I'm still sitting with emotions, especially Gertrude, your play. Um, and I, I actually have two questions. I want I wanted to ask Namli, um, you know, the idea of you said the ideal world is a world where love doesn't have to be revolutionary. And I've always thought about love as so political. Mm -hmm. Every type of love, um, you know, parental love, community love, romantic love, it's all political. And my imagination is so limited. 
that I can't actually think of love as not revolutionary. And so maybe I want to ask you to say a bit more of that vision of love in an ideal world. And um, uh, to Gertrude, um, I, a question also about memory and how, or, or time, as time passes, I've, I've seen um, you perform plays before and I'm thinking about this day in history. We're going. To, we're, it's an election day, um, and how does how does your memory change and your articulation of your art, where you draw on the personal quite profoundly as um, as as time progresses and we reach new political milestones or dystopian milestones, perhaps. Um, you know, how does it influence you looking back and thinking about um, your life and your art? Thank you. Um, just first of all, just thanks to, to Gertrude for um sharing a very powerful play with us and um something that also eats me very powerfully because i went through similar experience at that time and um but i, I wanted to just ask a question of mlamli is it mlamli yes um your 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 words were so powerful also just like i think um I'm sure that there's much more that that you could have said. Um, it touched me very deeply, and I, I really want to appreciate the the key messages that you stating about just the violence of as a society, the way that we do not appreciate people and see them for who they are. Um, I think that that is one of the biggest challenges we're facing, uh, you know, as an intersectional struggle. Um, and I find it difficult to, to think about, and I'm trying to, to think from a, like, personally, I, I was going to do a PhD and I was going to go in a certain direction, but that didn't work out. And so now I'm like rethinking what I'm going to do. And it connects with this theme of your conversation. Um, but I find it so difficult because we are so locked in the binaries. And even the people who say, I am not part of that binary is also locked in the binary. Um, and it's like we're going in a, I feel like we're going in a circle, you know, that we, that people who's living something else is even locked in the same maze um and i'm interested to hear from you you know what are the indicators what can we look to that that is showing us something different um really like you know not just the the flags that we fly but are there real examples that we have or are we still really very much in a in a state of like thinking about and conceptualizing Um, hello. Um, so I was just thinking about two things. Um, the first one being that I think what I'm really enjoying about the presentations that um, have been had, that have been presented so far is, you know, there has been an intentional defining of, you know, what love is to all of us differently and it's reminding me and the reason I appreciate it is that it's reminding me of in all about love bell hooks you know in the first few pages of the book speaks about how I don't know why I'm so nervous speaks about how you know we've been so elusive about the definitions of love you know and the way that we've you know tried to, def to define it is as this abstract, you know, really in the belly kind of thing, fiery kind of thing, but there isn't really a 
solid definition on it. And she's not saying that we should monopolize the definition of love, but she says that we need to come to a definition because if we don't define what this thing is, then what we're doing is that we're creating space for many very different violent manifestations of love. And that is how, you know, someone can say that, no, um, I'm hitting you because I love you, you know? So we're creating so much space for really problematic definitions of love. But if we begin to sit down as a community and say that, no, but it is healthy, it's about care, it's about accountability, you know, then we're building a healthier society. But the reason why many people have been averse to defining it like that is because they are afraid to find out that one, they have been unloved, and two, they have been unloving, mm. you know, and that's a sense, that's an accountability that she says as a community, we're not ready to get into. Um, and then the second thing that I'm thinking about um, after Mlami's presentation is that, you know, someti sometimes I think about how identity is located in our memory, you know, so we remember ourselves into existence. Um, and I think, you know, you see it with, in many different ways, but maybe also with people with dementia, it's dementia, with the dementia in that they, they, they forget themselves. Mm -hmm. And when they forget themselves, um, I don't know what I'm saying, but you know, you, you, for, you forget who you are. So in forgetting who you are, it means that you know, your, who you are, your sense of identity really lays in who you remember yourself to be. And in that point, what I want to say is that, you know, with people constantly saying that, ah, but colonialism was such a long time ago, Black people should just move on and forget. I mean, I suppose that there is a part of forgetting that can also mean liberation. But that can only happen if we're not constantly reminded into this existence. And we're reminded on the daily, you know, because these systems still exist. The other day we were at the airport and there was this white girl and, you know, she was comfortably going on talking to her mother on the phone about how the maid stole the money and that's what they do, la da 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 you know, and she was comfortably having this very racist outburst on the phone. And I was just thinking that we can never forget, we can never have this liberation that white people want to force us into by forgetting when they are constantly there to remind us of who we are and who we are not, you know? So, yes, thank you. Um, I think I have such a bad memory, but I think I remember everyone's question. <laughs> I was uh, help you. <laughs> so I'll just, I think I'll start with Professor Barbara Boswell's question um, on love. I think it's a very interesting question, actually. And I think I'll approach it from the place of, I don't think that, I don't think that especially for let me speak from a personal perspective but i also speak from a general perspective that i don't feel that many people are able to love without uh th the politics of love or the idea of love having to be revolutionary being forced on them i think the idea of reimagining love outside of being uh, a revolutionary act would be something that I don't think currently many people have the privilege of doing. And so I think in thinking about the idea of love being political, I think while I do agree, I think I have certain reservations when it comes to that, prof. Because um, I, I, I don't think that currently I can think of love without having to be revolutionary. I just think that us speaking about love as a revolutionary act 
means that love has to counter certain things. And so how love has become established within the construct of society is that you are in love, but you're always fighting against something whether or not you are conscious of that. So for example, uh, a woman will be in love with another woman and then um, they are having, they are in love and are enjoying their relationship together, but they are fighting against societal constructs that are against that very love. And so I think that that constant idea of love having to be revolutionary is something that is forced upon most people in society. And while I'm not saying that that is the only way of looking at love, but I'm saying that is the most prevalent way of looking at love because of how our society is constructed. And so I cannot uh, possibly say that I am able to imagine love without being a revolutionary act. So I think it always carries some sort of politics with it. Um, hope it makes sense. All right. And then. Oh, okay. Um, which would be the idea of binaries. I just think that, ooh, I think the, 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 the idea of binaries is something that is difficult to get out of, as you had stated. I think it's very, very difficult to get out of because even someone like myself, I, I, I try to think of myself outside of the idea of binaries, but always, there'll always be some form of, of regression, if I could call it that, back into the idea of binaries. And so I think that is where the work of activism comes in. You know, it's that we should constantly push back at the idea that the only way of imagining ourselves and imagining identities has to be within certain binaries, you know. So we've always got to be doing the work of pushing back. And that is why I don't think activism will ever become irrelevant to society because we will always be pushing back because there is always a need to be pushing back. And so, um, yeah, that's all. I've got two minutes for Barbara's question. And if I remember correctly, the role of memory and my art, is that it? Um, a, a few years ago, I, um, I went to a, a family dinner and I just started learning Koi Koi Kavab at, at UCT. And my aunt, who's 84, the last of, of all my, my family, started counting. And then I realized that she was counting in Koi Koi Kavab. And I said, Auntie Uni, you're counting in Koi Koi Kavab. And she says, yes, like, you know, so what? And then I said, but did you people speak it? And I was so, I had this intense, intense pain and regret. My mother was much, much older than her. And that I never, ever had that conversation with my mother. So, yes, I, um, I use my, my art, my memory as political activism. And now a play I wrote many, many years ago. Um, I don't know if it was in our weave book, Yesterday's Princess. I've now added a koi kogabab aspect to it. So, yes, that is I, my, the questions that I have every day is part of what I uh, write. And it's yeah, it's therapeutic and it's all things I don't understand. And the reason why I wrote the Yesterday's Princess was about my mom, when she was getting really old and I was struggling with the fact that people get older and how to deal with it, you know? So it comes out of my own, really you write, it comes out of all my personal struggles, that everything I write is <laughs> deeply, deeply, deeply personal and political. And my form of activism now, no more door to door. Thank you very much. For two minutes. Uh, uh, comrades, well, well, well uh, even before we um, end the session, we do want to acknowledge a question from our Zoom platform, even if we don't have time to oh, answer yes, of course, it. Please. We have a Zoom okay, so this is a question from Lee Walters. Um, and it says, I am thinking here how the denial of racism is not new to South Africa. Can you maybe link the denial of struggle to the denial of race or racism? Are you finding that young people are denying the presence of racism? Um, if they're denying racism, what can you identify as processes that enable such denial? But if they are not, how are they explaining their logic of a denial of struggle? I think that's for you. Like, for me, 
<laughs> so, so unfortunately, we do have to end this panel. Good. We're running really, really late. <laughs> Chair? Sure? Chair? Okay, I, I'm going to take it upon myself to answer that question and, and uh, as you share. It in it. Your? And I'm going to do it by means of an anecdote, which is that when my middle nephew was around 10 years old, he, he came home one day and he said, oh, auntie, we've been studying a at school. It was really bad, eh? I was like, yeah, it was pretty terrible, my son. He goes, no internet. I was like, yeah, we had, <laughs> we had no cell phones. We had to organize the anti apartheid struggle on the landline. <laughs> and he was like, yo, now I can see why you rose up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now internet. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>